this was a paper that caught my attention recently. It's about multi-echo sequences uh, specifically applied to resting state data. And multi-echo sequences have actually been around for a while. They're not that widely used, at least as of the publication of this paper, which was in 2020 by Lynch and colleagues. And I'm going to start with a very, very brief review of resting state. I know that most of you probably are familiar with it, but just talking about why in particular they're applying multi-echo to resting state, uh, some of the issues that are known with resting state, and then go through their results. So you've probably all heard about you know, the Biswall original 1995 study establishing resting state connections. And really this was simply observing correlations between the bold signal of distinct regions and distinct voxels. Now it was noticed pretty early on that you, you didn't need much data to find these so-called networks of the brain. So reliable, robust correlations between different constellations of regions. So in general, only about five minutes of data, let's say high quality data, the person's not moving too much, is needed to detect networks. So for example, the resting state network, the best known one, which has two key nodes of the uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate, you could find that in pretty much anybody with just five minutes of resting state data. And the clinical applications of these resting state networks have been documented because people have been looking at network differences between, say, people with schizophrenia and controls and trying to determine whether that leads to any kind of insight as to how disturbances in the normal functional architecture and connectivity can give rise to some of these disorders. So again, here's the original Biswall study. And what he did and what we do these days mostly is create a seed region here highlighted in this red circle. This was in the motor cortex. And then simply seeing where does this correlate with other regions in the brain. So you can see on the right, this is the functional connectivity map showing correlations between this seed region, averaging across the time series for all of the voxels in that region, and then seeing what other voxels, what other clusters show a significant correlation with it. And on the left is a task activation map, I believe, which also shows just simple motor cortex activity. And the idea was you can uncover, even at rest, even if the person isn't doing anything, they're not pressing any buttons, they're not thinking about anything in particular, you still see certain regions of the brain seem to be in communication with each other, some more than others. And this makes sense with things like the motor network. They seem to always be in some kind of synchrony and we've interpreted that as, you know, they're, they're primed. They're ready to communicate. They're ready to coordinate and give rise to the normal coordinated behaviors that you'll need to navigate through the world. Also, with those networks, like I said, we can see some subtle but distinct differences between things like healthy controls, uh, populations with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, looking at something like the resting state network. <clears throat> now, that's not the only one, obviously. There are many others as well, but there is a diagnostic angle to it. And we're seeing more and more these days the combination of resting state data with things like transcranial magnetic stimulation as a, a therapeutic tool to alleviate symptoms of depression and also these days trying to alleviate drug addiction. Now, this has become very popular for many reasons. <clears throat> The most outstanding reason is, historically, resting state scans did not take that long. There seems to be a convention of around 5 to 10 minutes. And I can say from personal experience, going back through the years helping write grant applications, it's just easy to squeeze it in at the very end. I'm sure a lot of people have been in this same situation. You budget for a certain amount of time, like an hour, hour and a half per subject in a grant, and you notice after you know, the anatomical scan, all the functional scans, maybe a diffusion scan, you have maybe five or 10 minutes left over. What do you do? Why not? It doesn't really cost you anything extra and it doesn't require any additional training. So that's why it's become popular and why so many people collect it. Here's a more full range of different networks that are available. I'm not gonna go through all of them, obviously. This is by Ryan Mutzel and colleagues in 2016. And this is using some, something called independent components analysis 
to try to extract these same networks. So ICA, which is a topic we'll come back to in the current paper under discussion by Lynch and colleagues, uses a signal separation analysis, both spatial and temporal, to decompose your overall map, which includes spatial components, right? There's these three-dimensional images, daisy chained together into a four-dimensional data set, and also the temporal components, which is your time series at each voxel. ICA tries to make them as independent as possible, and they found with great success that they happen to recover these robust conventional networks in the brain, such as default mode, such as visual, motor, all of them. <clears throat> now, all that sounds great so far, but we also know that there are many issues with resting state analysis. One, and this is also on the flip side, it's advantage, it's unconstrained. You know, the subject, we tell them not to think about anything in particular. I'd say these days, it's more approved of to have them have their eyes open instead of closed because falling asleep or dozing off may be qualitatively different than just somebody at rest, alert and awake, but not really doing anything in particular. So it's unconstrained, which means you don't have any real control over what they're doing, which, like I said, is a feature. It's not exactly a bug, but it does potentially introduce some confounds and it can be difficult to try to establish different resting state experiments on the same playing field. Another one, which is more serious, is they're frequently underpowered for reliability which is one of the issues that Lynch and colleagues is going to focus on and what they are trying to address with more updated sequences. When I say reliability, I mean, let's say you're doing a within subject analysis. Let's say you're doing pre post intervention or something like that. If there's not a high amount of reliability, meaning there's not a high chance you'll be getting the, the same overall resting state pattern from one to the next scan, that can be a serious issue if you're trying to make claims about, yes, the resting state network did in fact change significantly, as opposed to it was just some random variation that you would expect. Oh, so I have a quick question about that. Yes. Um, for being frequently uh, underpowered, mm -hmm. is that related to the like length of the scan, or is it more about just resting state in general? I would say it's more related to the length of the scan, which okay. I'll, yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to preface our discussion of Lynch with a couple of papers by Stephanie Noble, because she, she published about this back in 2017, a couple of papers that I think uh, people should read before they consider including resting state analysis, because it gives a very sobering picture about what reliability looks like across the brain for your typical five minute scan as opposed to half an hour. Yeah, okay, thanks. Great question. And lastly, anybody who has collected their own resting state data knows that they're highly susceptible to motion related artifacts. Now motion is always a problem regardless of whether it's a task data set or resting state, but it's a little bit more insidious in resting state because any motion can introduce spurious correlations across the entire brain. If you think about it, it makes sense because if we're looking at correlations and let's say I'm scanning somewhere at the back of the brain, obviously we're you know, covering the entire head, but I'm focusing on part of the back of the brain and the person moves a little bit, that's also going to introduce some signal fluctuations in the front of the brain as well. And since they're both happening in sync, I could be getting a spurious correlation between two regions, which really is just due to artifacts. With task-based, it's more if the motion is consistently correlated with the task itself. Let's say it's a scary picture and the person jumps a little bit, or it's an electrical shock and they jump a little bit. That can also be a confound. But in general, people just moving slightly during a task analysis isn't as big of an issue as it would be with resting state. And uh, Van Dyke 2010 gives a very compelling demonstration of that. <clears throat> And so more to the point for the question that was just asked, 
There's also the question of how long of a scan do you need? And this really addresses the root problem of many of the issues with reliability that I see and some of the issues with <clears throat> some of the resting state analyses that I consult on. Because whenever we're thinking about a task analysis, usually a lot of thought goes into, all right, we need, let's say, 20 to 30 trials per condition, and we need this much jitter to make the design achieve a certain amount of power. And a lot of thought goes into that, and people usually collect, I don't know, 30 to 60 minutes of task data, something like that. It's, it's not small. And for some reason, well, there are good reasons for it, I understand, but when people come to task, or sorry, to resting state, they go, yeah, whatever, just, you know, five, 10 minutes, who cares? And if you're not giving the same amount of respect to your resting state analysis as you do to task, it's no wonder why a lot of the results are frequently unreliable. So this was a paper by Stephanie Noble in Cerebral Cortex 2017. And you can see here in this lower left figure, and I forget exactly what the cutoffs were for reliability, but there's poor, there's fair, good, and excellent. Let's say we're low achievers, we just want fair, right? Notice if we just collect one session of a 12 minute scan, we're in the poor reliability quadrant of this. And if people collect multiple sessions, let's say two 30 minute scans, you're in good. And for excellent, this is probably beyond what most people would even consider for a resting state analysis. So that's important to keep in mind. And also important to keep in mind is the difference between regions and how reliability changes. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you can see here, and this will rhyme with the Lynch article as well, there is much lower reliability in the more ventral regions of the brain than there is in the more dorsal and lateral cortical regions. And if you've ever analyzed an fMRI data set, this makes sense. The more ventral areas are notorious for dealing with susceptibility artifacts with signal dropout, and not surprisingly, we're also getting very low reliability estimates in functional connectivity as well. Even for very long scans, we're still getting pretty low reliability. <clears throat> so that brings us to the current paper, Lynch and colleagues. This was published in Neuron in 2020. And here are the characteristics of what they analyzed. So they only collected data from two subjects like the team themselves collected data from two subjects and compared to a few other data sets as well. <clears throat> so within these two subjects, over a period of nine months, they collected six hours total of multi-echo data. I'll get to what multi-echo is in a second. And these were 24, 14 and a half minute scans total. So a lot of data across a long period of time and many individual scans as well. Now for comparison, they looked at a few other well-known resting state studies. You can find these online at openneuro.org. There's the Midnight Scan Club. You may have heard of them. I think they're out at WashU. Great name, by the way. That was a, a PR masterstroke. Uh, there's 14 subjects. I forget how long they were scanned exactly, but I think it was more than usual, more than a typical scan. There was the Newbold Cast Study, which had an N of three. If you remember, that's where they immobilize the arm. And then during the immobilization and pre and post immobilization periods, they collected some uh, resting state data to see how these networks were responding to a period of immobilization. And then my connectome, which was about 10 years ago, Russ Poldrack, he's out of Stanford now. He scanned himself many, many times over a period of I want to say a year, year and a half, it was a considerable amount of time. So this is an N of one. Now, the key point here is that these comparison studies were single echo. The two original subjects were also reanalyzed a little bit later using single echo. And they used uh, another control condition in which they plucked uh, an individual echo from this multi-echo scan and use it as like a single echo surrogate. All right. So briefly, when we're talking about echoes, just brief de detour into MRI physics, we, we've heard about TR, that's repetition time. That's the amount of time it takes 
from acquiring one scan to then acquiring the next scan. And TE is echo time or time to echo, in which you apply your radio frequency pulse, okay, you tilt everything onto another plane, and then you wait a certain amount of time. It's usually on the order of say 10 to 50 milliseconds, somewhere in that range, before you collect the signal. And that's used to maximize the bold contrast. So this is a so-called single echo sequence I'm showing right here. We have you know, radio frequency pulse, we have some kind of gradient echo, and we try to hit a sweet spot where we have the most distinction in the bold signal. Now, this is somewhat coarse because, as you'll see later on, the motivation for multi-echo is that different regions of the brain are going to have different sweet spots of their echo time. And multi-echo goes away towards alleviating this concern. So the results in this study, okay, so now we're, we're first looking at things like the Midnight Scan Club. Those are the first two major panels that you see. There's cast induced plasticity down here, and then my connectome. So reliability, obviously warmer colors indicate higher reliability. You see things like, okay, there's certain regions, let's say dorsal lateral, a little bit more improprietal, something like that, have more reliability than certain area, certain other parts of the brain. And also in these different columns, you can see different echo times Right, so five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, and so on. And you notice that there does appear to be a certain range, let's say within the 20 to 30 millisecond, in which you have better reliability than you would with lower echo times. And also of note, down here in the lower right, if we're looking at overall reliability over time, remember each of these studies from Midnight Scan Club to My Connectome has a lot of resting state data. The more superior, the more cortical areas, like lateral parietal, lateral frontal, as you go with scan durations of 10 to 15 or so, you start to get, you know, okay reliability. It's not bad, probably work for most purposes. But notice again, these subcortical areas, like the thalamus, the nucleus accumbens, the caudate, really no matter how long you scan, the reliability stays pretty low. Which again, this dovetails with what Noble and colleagues found in 2017. We know that the more ventral parts, the subcortical areas are a problem. And especially for clinical studies, we know that things like reward-related reward regions, such as nucleus accumbens, can be important for distinguishing between groups who may have let's say obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, as compared to control groups, we could be missing a lot of important information if our reliability is poor. And also if our signal dropout is bad as well. So this is where multi-echo comes in as a potential solution. Because again, like I said, different regions of the brain may have different echo times, which give you the best bold contrast and by extension, maybe the best reliability as well. What they did was, in the two subjects they acquired, they had a multi-echo sequence. And as you'll see, there are several different echoes you can acquire from. And really, it's up to the physicist to give an estimate of what range that you want. And then they can weight them by different amounts to try to combine them again and give you a optimally combined multi-echo. In the paper, they call this OC. ME. Like I just said, different brain regions, again, they hypothesize may have different optimal echo times. And in addition, the signal decay, remember, uh, so if we're talking about something called T2 star, which you may have heard of as well, that's your transverse relaxation. Okay, T1 relaxation is how long it takes for the longitudinal axis to recover. T2 is the decay after you flip all the protons into the horizontal plane, how long it takes for them to recover back to where they were initially. And this signal decay, that's part of the sequence protocol in which we try to find these sweet spots so that you can find the most distinction between signal decay between different tissue types or different regions. <clears throat> this can also be used to remove noise artifacts because it can be used to identify things like motion, heat, 
uh, scanner artifacts and so on. And this is a process we can also use with that independent components analysis I referenced previously. So ICA can pick up on some of these different issues. And what the authors did in this current study <clears throat> was in addition to the multi-echo sequence, they also looked at it uh, in conjunction with ICA to try to remove noise and therefore get a cleaner signal in some of these regions. Now, that being said, if we know that there are certain regions, such as, let's say, orbital frontal cortex, roughly, or nucleus accumbens, somewhere around this area right here, in this white circle, that's a notorious signal dropout region. We know that. And by extension, probably low reliability as well. So notice we have these different echo times, okay, TE1. Let's say that's 13 milliseconds, then we have a range of different echo times. And notice, uh, you know, certain echo times, let's say, you know, 31 looks pretty good. Uh, we get to 84 milliseconds and you can just eyeball it and say, yeah, that's not great. A lot of signal drop out there. Now, what they do is look at, again, a you know, pretty susceptible region, another region that's pretty robust. And this was the, some prefrontal cortex region. Okay, so it's more dorsal, it's more lateral. It's a little bit more robust to signal dropout, for example. And then you can see what the signal looks like across a range of different TEs. So in, in blue, or let's say purple, that's your subgenual ACC, and in green is the PFC. And you can weight different echo times and try to then recombine them into an optimal image. So this should try to alleviate some of the worst effects of some of the different echo times and filter in the best effects, most optimal effects of different echo times. So the end result, once we recombine them, is this OCME image down here, and you can compare it to these ones over here. So notice, in the first couple of echo times, it seems like, okay, you can kind of make out better the, the so-called true outline of the brain, but there's not great distinction between things like CSF and gray matter. Whereas with higher echo time, you find greater distinction between tissue types, but there's more signal dropout. And here you get the best of both worlds. That subgenual area is more recovered, and there's better distinction between different tissue types in this image as well. So when we do that, we say we combine them, <clears throat> and we weight them, say the appropriate amounts to try to get the most contrast between them. You can also see these weighting maps over here. How much do we have to weight different echo times to get the best map, right? So those regions that have a hotter color, more red, more orange, we give those a higher echo time, and the ones that are lower, we give those a lower echo time. So you see the cortical areas and also some slices showing you some subcortical areas as well, such as you know, putamen, globus pallidus, and caudate. So if we look at this, and again, here's now where they're combining things like the multi-echo and also ICA aroma. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Here is the what they would consider the optimal combination, both using multi-echo and then ICA aroma. And just looking at a very typical seed region, somewhere in the you know, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, how well does this recover the default mode network? And it's much stronger in these cases across things like Midnight Scan Club subjects, for example, and also their subjects as well. Now compare this with something like uh, just extracting a single echo indexed by TE2. So just be looking at this single echo right here. So they're basically simulating a single echo within their data set combined with IC aroma. Not surprisingly, these maps don't look as strong. And also, if you just look at something like uh, fast TR single echo, okay, they redid this with the same subjects, but just using single echo, not multi-echo, it's also pretty poor compared to using multi-echo combined with aroma. So now we can also expand that to look at curves and compare them to the comparison data sets as well. So these reliability maps, 
Okay, again, we're, we have a, a few different echo times here. Just note them, five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 14 and a half milliseconds. You can see these reliability maps, again, warmer colors, higher reliability in both the cortical areas, lateral, medial walls, and also in the subcortical areas. This is the cerebellum down here, by the way, and then those subcortical areas and basal ganglia. So again, the reliability, we can see that it is pretty high for multi-echo and aroma and slight decreases, corresponding amount of decrease as you go to a uh, simulated single echo sequence. But the key part of this down here, if we look at these reliability curves, so with the current study, remember they had single sessions of 14 and a half minutes, right? If you, so the red curve is optimally combined multi-echo and ICA. Not surprisingly, it does the best, especially as you increase scan duration. It's somewhat of an exponential decay, but around 15 minutes, the reliability is close to 0.8, which is very, very nice. All right. And these other curves down here, the ones that are in purple, shaded, dotted, a little bit difficult to distinguish them from my screen, but these are the comparison studies. So Casanus Plasticity, Midnight Scan Club, My Connectome. All you need to know is across all of them and for extending out to 30 minutes or so, their reliability is worse than it is for their optically combined multi-echo sequence. All right, just a couple more figures here. So if we look at the level of reliability obtained using a multi-echo sequence, we can see that it's greater than a standard, sorry, single echo sequence with a fast sampling rate. So this gets into one of the reasons why multi-echo, let's say up until now, hasn't been as popular. It does require, in general, more time and a little bit lower spatial resolution. So people who are more interested in higher temporal resolution, higher spatial resolution, have preferred to stick with single echo. Although these days, the technology seems to be more feasible for running multi-echo and still having pretty good, pretty decent temporal and spatial resolution. So what we can see here, they're zooming in. Again, this is their you know gold standard, let's say. This is their optimally combined and ICA denoised. They have insets showing where the two sets of reliability are most pronounced. So if we look here around the frontal pole, and we compare that to a single echo sequence, also using ICA aroma, the reliability is much higher for multi-echo than it is for single echo. You're pretty much seeing this for all of their different figures. It's really just variations on the same theme. And if we look at the cerebellar structures, for example, this is focusing in on the cerebellum and subcortex, again, around you know, 14 and a half millisecond echo time. Their combined, optimally combined uh, method seems to be far superior than any of the alternatives. Really, no matter what kind of variation you're looking at, optimally combined multi-echo and IC aroma does the best. Or I should say multi-echo aroma. And these curves down here, you can see, okay, subcortical and cerebellum in general is never really going to surpass the average reliability of the cortex, but we can still get pretty good reliability around 0.5 to 0.6 if we use these new scan sequences that they're promoting. Now, the last figure from their paper was how well can you recover some of the most important networks using their methods. So here we're parceling the brain into many different networks. Again, how many are there really? It's kind of up for debate, but some of the most robust and most well-known ones, obviously default mode network. There's a visual network, frontal parietal. There's about you know, a dozen, maybe 15 listed here. Now these plots in the middle in part B show you essentially the same thing as what we're seeing before. They use an adjusted RAND. Think of that as the reliability of the overall network itself. And again, not surprisingly, their method, 
multi-echo and multi-echo ICA does better than any of the alternatives and especially compared to their simulated single echo sequence. If we compare it to the other studies like Midnight Scan Club, Plasticity, MyConnectome, again, does very well at a level of P less than 0 0.001 compared to all of them. Just a note about how they did this. So again, the single scans they had were 14 and a half minutes. They compared this to the held out scans, which should be pretty robust. So like they should converge to that point of what like the true network is for that subject. If you scan them for five and five hours and 45 minutes, you should get a very strong indication of what the network really looks like. And here you can see that just with 14 and a half minutes compared to hours and hours of scanning, the networks seem to align pretty well. And this is reflected in that adjusted RAND in these plots over here. And I have a question? Yes. <clears throat> what, what were the TR, so the fast TR was 800 milliseconds? Mm -hmm. And then the, the, um, the um, OCME was, was it 1355 TR? I'm not sure actually, I need to go back and read that, but is that what they listed? I thought I saw that in the, in the, the um, in the article, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the trade-off you were referring to earlier, the fast TRs versus... Yeah. Right, yes, yeah. You need to echo more than once, you need a longer TR, so. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what do people consider fast TR that's somewhat subjective? I would say, since the standard seems to be two seconds, it has been for a long time, if you get to one second or less, so consider that fast TR. Obviously with multiband, you're able to go faster. And there's certain trade-offs with that as well. Uh, at the end of this talk, I'll discuss a little bit uh, some of the combinations of things like multiband with multi-echo and whether they can complement each other. Yeah, But I, I don't recall the exact TRs, but yeah, 800 milliseconds for the fast TR sounds right. Something like that. So the limitations that they point out, one is they're using relatively small sample sizes, both for the own data that they collected, which was two subjects, and then the other studies were ends of 1, 3, and 14. So again, that's always a caveat when you're looking at small sample sizes. Is this generalizable? I would say it's pretty convincing to me. You can make your own conclusions, but again, with Smaller sample sizes, there are ways to design them, such as in that CAST immobilization study, which intuitively makes sense and give you very powerful results. So even though, yeah, they only collected two subjects, it's worth noting, but I was pretty convinced by the results they presented. Another issue, and I think this is a little bit more open for debate is there was low overall head motion across the studies. So I can say, for example, you know, Russ Poldrack, he stayed very still. Midnight Scan Club, these are some dedicated graduate students. They were also, you know, they, they kind of know what's up with motion and resting state. So of course, they're going to be much more sensitive to remaining still. And same with the CAST study and in the, the subjects they collected in this study as well. So we need to keep that in mind. We don't know exactly how that would generalize to higher moving subjects, which is really part and parcel of clinical studies. It seems to be a confound that's very difficult to deal with. You know, we try to with things like regressing it out, but the fact is in every case that I've come across from special populations such as children to the elderly to people with schizophrenia, they're going to have higher head motion on average than the rest of the population. And so how does it generalize to them? We can't say exactly from this study. Also, this seemed to be more of a response to reviewers. You know, you can, you can kind of see which paragraphs you're like, yeah, some, somebody pointed something out in the, in the review and that's what they were going for. And yeah, you can say they didn't sample the full range of multi-echo. What does that mean exactly? You know, some people would only be content if they showed every possible five millisecond bin or something like that. 
But I think they did a pretty good job at showing, what was it, maybe five echo times. I think that's a pretty good range. It was very clear how the signal dropout and the reliability changed across the brain for those different echo times. So, you know, come to your own conclusions, but I don't see that as much of an issue. I think the 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 issue that there's pretty compliant subjects and also, you know, healthy, normal, normally developing subjects may give some pause as to whether we could uh, instantly say that this is going to be uh, applicable across clinical subjects, but I, I, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Remains to be seen. So in summary, multi-echo sequences generate better signal-to-noise ratio and reliability than a traditional resting state single echo scans, especially when combined with aroma, which is again, a kind of ICA denoising application. They don't talk about this much. There's only really one sentence. They say, you know, this, this may be applicable to task-based data as well. And if it is, you know, I'm all for it. If it seems to increase the overall quality without having too many trade-offs with spatial and temporal resolution, I think it's a great thing. And they say it's particularly useful for clinical contexts, not because they tested this on clinical subjects, but because you get so much better reliability now in those problem areas, you know, the cerebellum, the nucleus accumbens, for example. And that's why, especially since a lot of clinical studies focus on these areas, they think that it's going to be very useful. Uh, what I just want to come back to on this slide was, you know, historically, and they address this, multi-echo sequences haven't been used that often. And again, that's that spatio-temporal trade-off I was referring to earlier. Multi-echo sequences are going to be a little bit, not slower necessarily, but lower temporal resolution, right? Your TR is going to be lower, or should be, I should say longer. And also your spatial resolution is going to be coarser as well. Although these days, it seems as though we don't have as big of an issue as maybe we did 10, 15 years ago. And especially with combining it with multiband, which is a way to acquire multiple slices simultaneously, this could alleviate many of the concerns people have about lowered temporal resolution. Um, I also want to ask uh, if, if, if Scott's here and if he wants to say a few words about that, because he presented a few days ago in the fMRI lab meeting about combining these. And, it, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it did seem to do pretty well, if I, if I recall when we combine different multi-bands with multi-echo. Yeah, that's right. Uh, oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, so, um, at the lab, you know, we have multi-band that everyone's, everyone's been running, basically ABC parameters, which are a TR of 800 milliseconds, Spatial resolution of 2.4 millimeter isotropic, right? So GE has a working version of a multi echo multi band sequence, uh, which uh, the SAN group, Luke and Chris, are trying out for one of their studies. They've been running with it for a while now. Uh, so that one, the multi echo multi band. It has three echoes, uh, should be a multiband factor of four, and the resolution, so we have to back off a little bit on the spatial and the temporal, but it's three millimeters at 900 millisecond uh, TR, right? So uh, pretty close, pretty close. Um, so I'll just show, if I can share my screen, Andy. Of course, yeah, one second. Let's, let's show one result uh, from that. And this is very much, uh, uh, oh. you know, in the works. <laughs> um, we have abstract lines right now. So anyway, so this is just one example here where I'm showing uh, the calculated SNR uh, on subjects that had both the multi-band sequence and the multi-echo multi-band 
And I'm here I'm just calculating the temporal SNR uh, for a, should be a five minute resting state scan with both sequences, okay? Uh, and the point here is just that if you look going from left to right, the multi echo multiband is first brighter, which means it has higher SNR in general everywhere, right? But then specifically to what Andy was talking about, uh, we can see it doing much better in kind of a subcortical and frontal regions, right? Um, so yeah, and that's what that's, you know, that's, so people who have been using ABCD for a while have started finding out that yes, the, the, in, the interior, and, interior and lower in the brain, uh, you can suffer an SNR hit when you're using these multiband sequences, right? Because the coil sensitivity isn't as great in the center of the brain. When you go to higher multiband factors, there's some G factor and some, uh, say, reconstruction error that can play into that as well. Uh, but with this multi echo, the optimal, oh, I should say, I'm showing the optimally combined image from the multi echo because you're combining those multiple echoes, you know, you get an SNR boost just with that. And this is all before the additional step of the kind of multi-echo Tadana denoising you can do. So just an example of that, but we're, we're happy to see that, you know, basically brainstem, cerebellar, we get a boost. And then especially in the susceptibility frontal dropout region, we're getting a boost as well. So. We're hoping that, you know, again, uh, first look, we're hoping that plays out in obviously the, the network results and the task activation results. Um, and then going forward, um, so <laughs> uh, Luke and Chris have the, the kind of the working version of this that, that has the downfall of the recon on the scanner takes a little bit, so you have to pause every time right? i was going to ask if that's the it's emily i was going to ask if that's the scans that take extra now that, that's right yeah they, so basically if you, if you scan for nine minutes you're waiting two or three minutes for this okay. thing to recon okay which is not by no, yeah by no means is that optimal but i've heard that ge now has that solved in the next scanner software version so i'm hoping that in probably the new year uh we'll get that version installed. And if that recon pause is out of there, then I can, uh, you know, happily recommend it for people to start trying out their own studies. So. Because I mean, Andy, thank you for the, this really lovely presentation and, you know, overview of um, movement and, and resting state reliability. This is uh, really, really useful. And um, I'm sure that the recording will be will be helpful uh, for people who want to try to get an introduction to the area. But so I have a question because the, the case seems so compelling, seems so compelling from what you presented in the data, Andy, from, you know, 2022 was when this article was, was published. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised that this hasn't been adapted or adopted um, uh, you know, more, a little more readily. Is that, um, Scott, because of the technical issues that the sequences just haven't been there until more recently? So the, so the only drawbacks besides the recon, which really shouldn't be an issue, um, you know, because you're getting multiple echoes, that's basically, you know, if you get three echoes, it's basically tripling the data that you get. Okay, so there's that consideration. And then... And then it might, it might be just kind of the, the technical initial starting point for people to get over because, you know, if you want to do this uh, multi-echo ICA denoising, that is another step, right? And, you know, that's a whole other discussion about how automated or not automated or set points in there about decisions you have to make to denoise in there. But it's relatively automated to the fact that, you know, at the lab for, you know, what Chris and Luke are running, you know, we run fMRI prep like usual on the multi-echo data, right? And it processes each of those echoes 
uh, in there, right? And then you feed it into a Tegana denoising guy that does that extra step of multi-echo denoising. So, you know, it's already at the point where you can put it through a relative reliable, relatively reliable pipeline with those caveats uh, to, to get that done, right? But again, it's, it's you know, extras on everything, right? So, yeah. It, yeah. So in terms of the, the like the, um, the image size, I was thinking that this would occur just in case space, and once it was recon, then you go back to regular size. But you're saying that's not the case. That when yeah, it, no, sorry, because when when you do when you do that when you do that echo combination, you're doing you're doing that in image space, not case space. So you, you're basically okay. you recon each echo separately, and then you're doing the optimal combined. Uh, or sort of yeah. sort of <laughs> depending upon where you want to change your your echo. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. And 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 again, because those X, you know, you know, you can imagine, right? So up to your echo time that you usually get in bold, which is like thirty milliseconds, you know, the sequence takes a certain amount of time, right? Yeah. So roughly up to your regular <laughs> echo time. You're not adding any time or have to worry about anything, but adding on those extra echoes takes that additional time, which means then we have to adjust our resolution and temporal, right? So, and then you basically have to play that decision where do you want the ABCD parameters exactly or higher, like for HCP, um, or do you want to back off a little bit, get the multi echo, which definitely seems to be more reliable. And again, you know, bigger spatial size helps your SNR as well. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I, I, I'm all for multi echo, um, and I'm all for multi echo for everyone once the recount thing is solved. So, yeah. Well, it seems that since reliability is such a problem for for connectivity studies, whereas I'm not convinced we gain a lot by doing fast. Um, you know, fast TRs, you know, it's, we're, we're looking at slow activity, slow oscillation to the brain, and I don't think you gain a whole lot by going from, you know, even 2,000 to, 2, to 800. I mean, maybe I don't know, someone else can show me data that shows you do gain a lot for looking at uh, large scale networks. But. Usually we would try to keep the TR as short as possible just for the, uh, like, effect of motion. But going from 800 to 2000, I don't know, like, how much of a difference that would end up being. We usually were around 1000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, the, 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 the one we're using right now is that we can do the three millimeter resolution at 900. So it's, okay. it's, not, it's not too different. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all again for your time. Uh, Scott, thanks so much for telling us about that is exciting and I hope that we can follow up on that and see whether people can can use that for their own studies yeah it's great I, th I think the users who are not me <laughs> who, who have more interest and experience with subcortical and cerebellar uh, it'd be interesting to see how it plays out there definitely all right well thank you all I'll see you again in a month have a great weekend